All right, let's, uh, let's begin. So special welcome to all of you, especially the new ones, because the seats are quickly filling up. So uh, uh, great to have you here. Um, I want to, first of all, to acknowledge Maureen Somerville. Maureen Somerville comes from the uh, early days of UTSE. I graduate. It was so early that the first few classes that she had was actually on the downtown campus because uh -huh. construction wasn't quite finished here. And uh, Maureen served as nine years on governing council and we overlapped by eight, eight years and it was just a wonderful experience and she was always a very strong supporter of UTSC uh, as well as UT in general. So uh, thank you for your contributions, Maureen. Thank you for being here. And if you, you want to explore a rival series, uh, she's actually bringing Canadian perspectives, and we're going to try to make sure that the timing works out, that we don't overlap. So you can, so you can, yeah, so keep, keep you busy. So I'm, I'm Bill Goff, and I serve as the Vice Principal Academic and Dean here at UTSC. Um, I'm excited to uh, our third talk in the, in the series of, of four. So next week will be our, our final of this series. We will be planning something uh, for the fall because it's clearly been successful. Um, it's a real pleasure to me to introduce our, our speaker. And before I talk about her, her uh, great uh, accolades, I want to mention the fact that uh, until recently at UTSC, um, we had 13 women that were full professors. So what a full professor is, there's a, we start off as an assistant professor, we work really, really, really hard, we get tenure, we become associate professor, sometimes there's a little bit of a lull, and then they work really, really hard, and then eventually <coughs> um, promoted to the rank of, of professor. Um, at UTSC, we have 55 male professors and 13 uh, uh, women full professors. And you've been exposed to Today will be your third one. Uh, some of you remember Maidy Ann introduced our first speaker, so she's a full professor in the Department of uh, Biological Sciences. Our speaker last week, Ann Emanuel Byrne, who talked about uh, health uh, in a Canadian perspective, is also a full professor, and today's speaker is, is as well. And um, these are remarkable women uh, in their own right, but they're also remarkable because of their career path, and that uh, often they were the, the first of the first woman to do this, the first woman to do that. And um, disproportionately, they provide uh, leadership on this campus compared to the percentage of uh, full professor women that are uh, leading departments. It's a higher percentage than full professor men. So they uh, have had remarkable careers, but they've also been called upon to do uh, service work. And Grace is one. She's currently the chair of uh, political science and is a, as the dean. And, formerly as the Vice Dean, always appreciated the clarity of thought that Grace <laughs> brings to essentially everything she does, and I'm sure that will be reflected in today's uh, presentation. Um, I learned things uh, that I didn't realize that Grace had done. She's done a lot more than I, <laughs> I assumed. That's probably true of a lot of the faculty members that, uh, at the campus. Her uh, main areas of interest are comparative public policy, the role of international institutions in regulating transatlantic agricultural and food trade disputes, Canadian federalism uh, in intergovernmental relations, policy networks and governance, the role of ideas in policy making, and the impact of economic globalization and political internationalization on the domestic politics and governance of agriculture and food. Uh, isn't that kind of breathtaking? <laughs> my breath away. Uh, very impressive um, uh, areas of expertise. Um, Grace, uh, Professor Skogstad has published, says here, 10 books. Is that true, Grace? Well, some of them are edited. Okay. <laughs> so, edited books still take a lot of effort because you've got to get, it's like uh, crawling academics is not easy if they're like cats. Um, very difficult sometimes. So, there's a tremendous amount of effort, but um, uh, on, on her webpage, it has a list of called selected books, and there's six of them listed. Um, so quite prolific. Um, I looked on uh, uh, Scopus last night, check you out there, and uh, she's published many articles as well as, as these books, uh, and these articles have been well received uh, within her academic community. Uh, she has served as the president of the Canadian Political Science Association, 
So not only does she do, do excellent uh, research, uh, uh, serve uh, locally as a chair, but also serves her, has served her community. So I welcome Grace to, to the stage to, to present the material. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks. So thank you for those kind comments, uh, Bill. Uh, it's always a little bit strange to hear people describe you. Uh, you know, that description sounds like somebody who doesn't have a whole lot of focus. You know, <laughs> flitting, flitting from, from uh, subject research area to research area. But I assure you, it, it does come together in some fashion or other. So I really do appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, it's uh, been a good uh, opportunity for me to think about Canadian politics, in particular to think about Canadian federalism. Um, so I've been teaching Canadian politics and, and in particular Canadian courses on Canadian federalism and intergovernmental relations for almost, for, for really for my entire career uh, and that's been before I taught it, uh, at, uh, before I came to the University of Toronto Scarborough, I taught at Nova Scotia at St. Francis Xavier University, and I was born in Alberta, and I studied in, um, at the University of uh, British Columbia. So I have a perspective on federalism that is, well, if it's not, it's not entirely pan-Canadian because I've never lived in Quebec, but I have lived in at least uh, three, uh, four of the five regions of, of Canada, counting British Columbia as a separate region. Uh, so I think that um, that perspective, I think, has helped me to understand uh, Canadian federalism. And um, what I've tried to do over my career is to think about how our federal system affects the politics and public policies of Canada. Now, I was just speaking to, to Jean here, and uh, she comes from northern England, which many of you know is not a federal system. It has taken on some federal features of late. Um, there's been a certain amount of devolution of power to, to Wales and to Scotland. Uh, and of course, uh, England is, uh, United Kingdom, I'm sorry, is part of the European Union, or was part of the European Union, uh, soon not to be. Uh, so uh, the concept of a federal system is not entirely one that everybody is familiar with. Uh, and so what I wanted to do today is to, to emphasize what it is uh, that the particular challenges of a federal system, look at how well Canada is doing. Uh, the report card here, I think, is due at 150 years of, of our uh, political and economic union. Uh, look at how well we're doing, and then to think about where we're not doing so well, where are the challenges. So let me start here uh, with, uh, with, the, with federalism and with what I mean by federalism. Um, so federal systems, as you may or may not know, are systems in which you divide legal authority between two orders of government, okay? So that you've got provincial and territorial governments, as we know in Canada, and then we have the government of Canada. And that arrangement, that division of legal authority uh, between two orders of government has been uh, absolutely fundamental to the creation of Canada. And it's very obviously the case that we would not have formed a political and economic union in 1867 had we not created a federal system. Quebec was adamant that that province retain the jurisdiction that it needed in order to be able to uh, preserve its culture, preserve its way of life. Uh, and those sentiments were also uh, very much alive in the maritime provinces that joined in 1867, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And that formula of provinces having quite a sphere of jurisdiction in which they're able to pass legislation and regulate on behalf of their citizens and also tax and to spend on behalf of their own citizens is combined then with a central government, the government of Canada, which has its own jurisdiction, of course. And in 1867, that arrangement was such that it was um, the government of Canada which was really dominant. Uh, the uh, government of Canada had responsibility for the most important powers of the day. 
Uh, that included, of course, defense. It included settling the West. It included immigration, which was absolutely crucial to settling the West. It included uh, external affairs, such as we had them, because, of course, Great Britain still had quite a lot of control over our foreign affairs. So the central government was dominant. But what has clearly happened over the last 150 years is quite a lot of decentralization to the provinces. Provinces have become very powerful governments in their own right. They collect about half of all of the revenues uh, that are collected by governments in Canada. And the most important powers that, uh, uh, that provinces have are things that really seem to matter most to people's lives. Control over education, control over social policy, uh, control over natural resources, which has in the case of provinces like Alberta, has been a huge boon because, of course, it puts a lot of revenues in the provincial uh, treasury. So we've seen over time this, uh, this quite, quite incredible shift in our federation from a strong and really dominant government. In fact, some people argue that Canada in, in 1867, you couldn't even call it a federal system. You could call it a quasi-federal system because the government of Canada so dominated the provinces. But nobody would level that charge at Canada today. We are clearly one of the most successful federations um, uh, across the globe. Uh, we are the third oldest federation, uh, it long, long standing federation after the United States and Switzerland. And so it really, in many ways, is a success story. So now what I want to talk to you about today is um, uh, what, what is the formula, in a sense, for, for success here. And I'm not, going, I'm not here just to, to praise uh, federalism, but I'm here to sort of dissect its anatomy, to, to tell you what I think about um, you know, what's worked and what hasn't worked, and what we need to do better. And so what I'm, the, the central theme today here is that the only way the system works is when the two orders of government cooperate, when they decide to collaborate and cooperate. It doesn't work very well at all when each order of government wants to carry out its own jurisdiction, when each order of government wants to act unilaterally. Uh, it doesn't work very well. And so um, that's a, a big, that's, that, that's important that we, we've learned, I think, over 150 years to collaborate quite well. We don't always succeed. But the other big part of my talk, and it'll come up towards the end, is that as well as we've done, there are some real challenges in the system. And the most formidable challenge, I think, is how to bring I'm going to talk about three of them, but one of them is how to bring indigenous peoples into the federal framework, because they don't have a formal role in the framework yet. There are no formal institutions in place uh, to allow us or to enable governments to consult with indigenous peoples and, on the issues that matter most to them. So what I'm going to so, so now let me just start talking a little bit about some of the dynamics that are common to federal systems. And some of these dynamics can have quite negative consequences. You could even call them kind of pathologies when it comes to addressing problems um, that citizens think are fundamentally important. I want to start off with that, discussing some of those um, dynamics and pathologies. And then I'm going to uh, discuss uh, Canadians' perceptions of the federal system, how well we're doing, how well Canadians think the system is working. And I'm going to contrast Canadians' perceptions of, the, of our governments and our federal system with Americans' perceptions. There are some really interesting data here. And the reason to do that, of course, is the United States is a long-standing federation like us. But obviously, what happens in the United States happens, uh, matters hugely to what happens in Canada. It is, as I say, um, as we all know, I think everybody in this room knows how important the US is to us in terms of our economic well-being. It's our biggest trading partner. We need US markets to buy our oil and gas, our agricultural commodities, our automobiles, our auto parts. The list goes on. So I think that perspective that I'm going to bring to bear about examining how Canadians view their own governments and their own system versus how Americans view their own government and their own system can tell us a little bit about how well we are doing. And then uh, the final part of my talk will be to look at these challenges that uh, lie ahead for us 
Uh, some of them are ongoing challenges, and I'm going to talk about the need for governments to figure out a way to tackle climate change, the need for us to find a way to incorporate indigenous peoples into our governing structures so that they can have the social justice that they so much uh, deserve. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about international trading relations, simply because we are a trading country and so dependent upon trade. And all of those issues, let me reiterate, I think require collaboration across governments. So let me start then a little bit about some of the dynamics of federal systems and how they play out in Canada. So federal systems you know, do have some unique challenges and some unique dynamics as compared to a system where you have only one central government which has predominant powers. Uh, every government will have local, every, every country will also have local governments, but generally we make a distinction between federal systems and unitary systems, unitary systems being those in which you have a central government which really has almost all the authority and then the local governments uh, could have you know, some delegated authority, but federal systems you have these two orders of government that have their own autonomous jurisdiction and that are, as I say in Canada, powerful in their own right. So one of the things that happens when you create federal systems, and it is the reason why you create federal systems, is that you usually create them because you have within the overall territory some minorities that have their own nationalist aspirations. Right? So in the case of Canada, that has most obviously been Quebec. Right? Uh, we all know the strength of Quebec nationalism over the years. Um, I said that an agreement with Quebec was absolutely fundamental to the creation of the Federation. And that aspiration to run your own affairs, that nationalist aspiration to run your own affairs, can create huge vociferous tendencies in a country. It, it pulls at the unity of a country as those nationalist minorities generally want to run their own affairs. And so that is clearly one challenge that's very common to federal systems, and we've witnessed it, and I'll talk about in a minute about how we manage to, to deal with it. Second thing that is very common um, to federal systems is that when you create these two orders of government, provincial and, and national or federal, um, when you create those two orders of government, you build in a dynamic for competition. You build in a dynamic for governments to compete for public support. And in many ways, you could argue that in federal systems, you build in more incentives to compete than to cooperate. Because each order of government wants to hang on to its own jurisdiction, and it wants to get credit for doing things that the public wants. Or wants to, it's just generally, you know, that's the way you get credit is, is we took action, we're responsible for that, we don't want encroachment from the other order of government because it might impede our ability to do what we want to do and get credit for that. Now, I am not a uh, critic of competition, uh, by and large. I think competition can be a good thing. We've probably all been watching basketball and hockey, and we know that you know, athletes rise to their highest level when the competition can be extremely fierce. And I think our athletes have been, or Canadian teams have been doing quite well, although maybe not as well as the Toronto Maple Leaf fans would like, but uh, they've not been doing too badly at all. Um, but, and the same can, thing can happen when provincial and federal governments compete for credit. It can push the level of public policies up. It can mean that governments, uh, it can be a healthy competition. Got, citizens get more of the good public policies they want than they might not otherwise. They get better schools, for example, if Alberta's competing with Saskatchewan to try to uh, um, train a good labor pool uh, and to bring you know, qualified, uh, to have a qualified labor force. Uh, that kind of competition can be good. It can mean as well that you have, um, uh, besides education, it can mean also as well good health care. It can mean a lot of good things when governments are competing for the support of their populations. But it can also be a bad thing. Competition can also, uh, across governments, can also be a bad thing. And it means, becomes a bad thing when it means a race to the bottom. So by a race to the bottom, what we mean is that, uh, for example, governments um, lower their taxes, for example, in order to attract investment into the province. And then what happens is you don't have enough revenues. Governments don't have enough revenues to provide a high quality education or healthcare system or um, social assistance. Um, 
even policies that, that their citizens might well want. It can also be, a race at the bottom can be a particularly bad thing when governments compete with one another to lower the regulations around the environment. So they back off environmental protection because any measures around environmental protection could be a cost to investors. And so the way you attract investors into a province can be by you know, having lighter environmental regulations. And those things, I think most people would agree, um, are costs right, of, of competition. So competition can be a bad thing. And it can be a particularly bad thing, it seems to me, when it sets off what we call a blame politics. So by blame politics, I mean shifting criticism or criticizing the other order of government for its failure to act or blaming it when things go wrong. Now that isn't, we see a lot of that, and I'm going to give you a few, few, few slides in a minute. But we see, again, federal systems are particularly prone to this. If you just had one government that had all the authority, like you just had a government of Canada, you don't have provinces, the buck lands with the government of Canada. It's responsible when things go badly wrong. But in Canada, as in most systems around the world, as in most federal systems, there's a lot of overlap between the responsibilities of the government of Canada and the responsibilities of the provinces. And so that overlap opens up quite a lot of space for the other order of government or another government to be able to criticize and blame somebody when uh, the other, another government when things go wrong. An example that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, we're all familiar with it, is the, is the issue of health care. Not enough money, waiting list too long, who's to blame? Is the federal government because it doesn't supply enough money, or is it the provinces because they don't know how to organize their, their health care? And it's the provinces who are responsible. So those are some pathologies, this competition, this quest for competition, this buck passing. Uh, that goes on. And so let's, let's see how Canada is doing. If those are common pathologies, how are we doing? So, you know, maybe I'm getting soft in my old age, but I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, by which I mean that uh, we've solved some of the most pressing problems in front of us. Let me go back, back to the, the first challenge, which is not the pathology challenge, but the challenge of having national minorities in our midst and those national minorities wanting to separate. So I'm going to just put an image up here for you that uh, some of you <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe haven't seen this image or not. But it is, see up in the corner, it's Aslan 1995 in the Montreal Gazette, right? Um, and this is the tortoise bearing the heavy burden of federalism. So all of you will know that 1995 was the second referendum in Quebec, Quebec's second referendum to, to separate from Canada. First, as you know, it was 1980, and that one was won by, you know, not a healthy margin, but it was won by a decisive margin. Um, 1995, we know that if 1% one, 1 of the electorate, uh, uh, eligible electorate, had changed their mind Canada, as we know it, would not exist. That vote was that close, right? It was 49.42% voted uh, yes to sovereignty to secede from Canada, and 50.58% voted to stay in Canada. You don't really get much closer than that, I think. So, so here you have Aslan uh, you know, pointing out the burden the heavy burden for the tortoise. Um, and you know, we all know the story as well. It's the tortoise perseveres, and he wins the race, and or it wins the race, and um, the hare you know, didn't. But it's not so much about, when I look at this, this cartoon, I think it is a bit about perseverance. Obviously, it is about perseverance, continuing to make the case for Canada. But I think what made the case for Canada was that we were willing to adjust the federal system. Right? Um, we had been trying to do that for some time in the run-up from the 1980 referendum, the uh, run-up to the 1995 referendum. We had been trying to adjust the federal system to deal with the aspirations of Quebecers to have more autonomy, more right to run their own affairs in the province. Uh, we went through two 
horrific rounds of constitutional reform, both of which failed. Uh, and so when the formal route failed us in constitutional reform, what we did was to move into informal routes of change that did not require everybody to agree. So the government of Canada did a number of things. It delegated more um, authority to the province of Quebec when it came to immigration, which is huge for, for the province of Quebec because uh, as a French-speaking population, it does want to ensure that it gets the, the labor force, the immigrants that can speak the, the language. We also um, recognized, um, besides immigration, there were special concessions made on transfer payments and things like that. So there was accommodation, and I think after, actually, after the 1995 referendum, there was a lot more, should I put it, water poured in the wine on the part of English Canadian premiers, too, in terms of recognizing the special status or the asymmetry, if we want to put it that way, of Quebec vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other provinces. So we passed that test by being flexible, by being accommodating, and I think by recognizing that federalism only works when you respect diversity. When you respect minority rights, you respect diversity, and you accommodate that, and you compromise. Okay, and that's I think, was the formula that we had for keeping us together. Now, you know, that might, you know, sort of, you know, we are uh, 22 years on. It might not seem like a big deal that we managed to stay together, but it is a pretty big deal when you think about Brexit. Right? I mean, the, the UK deciding that it is not going to be part of a, what I would call a federal union. And there are likely to be knock-on effects, as we know, out of um, the Brexit, out of uh, the UK coming out of the European Union. And one of those knock-on effects will probably be Scotland. We already know that uh, the, the Scottish National Party is talking about a second referendum. And so, you know, the idea, the, 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 the reality of Canada finding a formula to cohere in an era where there are these, um, these fragmenting effects, these vociferous effects, I think is a pretty big deal. OK, so the biggest challenge, keeping the system intact, proving, resilient, proving to be resilient and accommodating the internal tensions. Now let me shift to the blame, to, let me shift to blame shifting. <laughs> OK, uh, the second challenge that I said federal systems have, and that is uh, the competition for credit taking, the inclination to engage in blame shifting, and to try to, uh, in that sense, just kind of create a lot of conflict in the system. So here we have an image that maybe is familiar to you. So, you know, uh, Justin Trudeau, gets elected. It's a kind of honeymoon period here. And the honeymoon period uh, lasts about a week, right? The honeymoon period is because, um, unlike his predecessor, uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, uh, Trudeau had campaigned on being open to discussing with provinces uh, any number of issues. While he was Prime Minister, a conservative uh, conservative uh, leader, while well, he was Prime Minister Stephen Harper, had met with the provinces on two occasions. He did not want to have first minister's meetings, as we called the meetings between the premiers and the prime ministers. He did not want to engage in any collaboration. He argued that, OK, the, fe the federal government has its jurisdiction, and it's going to stick to its jurisdiction. The provinces have their jurisdiction. Let them handle it. And really, there is not a lot of need for us to collaborate and to cooperate. But as you can see by week two, um, this is the typical image that we have of provinces in the federal system holding out their hand for money. Um, and so that, in a sense, is a dynamic. And I'll come back to it. Uh, but the dynamic, and the dynamic has really important consequences for all of us, right? I mean, here again, it, we see this dynamic that the provinces don't really have enough money for good health care. The poor patient is left there, not even on the stretcher, <laughs> while, the, while the federal government and the provinces haggle over uh, what's, the, what's you know, the dollars for health care. We're always short of dollars for health care, it seems. And so uh, this, this, one's, this cartoon is not taking any sides, obviously. It thinks they're both a pox on both houses, right? That they got the feds and the provinces haggling. It's not taking sides on who's to to blame, but it is the kind of common dynamic that we see 
in, in federalism. This kind of competition um, over scarce dollars uh, and uh, over um, blame shifting. Now, that blame shifting, that haggling over, over money is crucial because many of the core social programs that we rely on were created as joint ventures between federal and provincial governments. So we only get programs like health care, universal health care. We only get the Canada Pension Plan. We only get good social policies generally because of uh, federal-provincial cooperation. Um, and that necessity of federal-provincial cooperation is obvious because the federal government has typically had far more capacity to raise revenues than the provinces have, one thing. There's been more capacity in Ottawa to raise revenues for, for social programs. Secondly, there are huge differences across provinces in terms of their capacity to raise revenues. We happen to live in a very rich province. We're not always conscious of that. But uh, if you ever live in other parts of the country where the populations are smaller, the populations are not as wealthy, uh, they don't have natural resources, you will immediately be aware of those disparities in provincial revenue uh, capacity. Um, and then the, uh, so you've got, you've got these revenue disparities that are kind of vertical across the federal and the, and the provinces. You've got them horizontal disparities across the, uh, the provinces. But then you also have the reality that most of the social programs lie in provincial jurisdiction. So health is a provincial jurisdiction. Education is a provincial jurisdiction. Most of the social policies are in provincial jurisdiction. So the only way for us to get those good social programs is by the government of Canada putting in some money. And that government of Canada does it through what we call its spending power. It's able to spend its money any way it sees fit. Now, I think that it's a pretty good, pretty big deal that our, pro, uh, that our governments have cooperated to fund this social safety net in Canada. Uh, and I want to emphasize one other part of this. Besides monies for uh, specific programs like health care or, so, or um, uh, social assistance or uh, uh, post-secondary education, we all benefit at this university from, from federal money for, for post-secondary education, uh, there are also the equalization payments. Now, equalization payments are payments that go from the government of Canada to provinces that don't have the same capacity to raise revenues to fund their programs. Those provinces would have to raise their taxes much, much higher than other provinces would if they were going to be able to have the revenues to fund programs. So equalization, pro equalization is actually written into our Constitution. It's a requirement of the Government of Canada to make payments, equalization payments, to, to the provinces that are what we call the have-not provinces and that they don't have the same capacity to raise revenues. And that is what makes it possible as well. These equalization payments are what make it, what make it, what these equalization payments are what makes it possible for poorer provinces to carry out their own provincial jurisdiction as well. Right? So education, you know, from kindergarten through to end of post-secondary education is a, exclusively a provincial responsibility. But the equalization payments put enough money into provincial coffers, Saskatchewan, when it's a have-not province, all the maritime provinces. Ontario was a have-not province for a bit when we were in a recessionary period. Uh, it makes it possible for those poor provinces in Canada to have the same more or less high quality level of public services. Now, what does that say about Canadians and what does it say about the country as a whole? To me, it says quite good things. It says a lot of good stuff. Uh, things. It says that there is a widespread value in this country of redistributing wealth from, poor, from richer to poorer people. And that notion that we're kind of all in this together, we're all one country, we do need to redistribute if everybody's to have the same standard of public services, I think is absolutely fundamental to keeping the country together. And it happens because of federalism. And I want to point out to you that the United States does not have an equalization program. It does not redistribute wealth from richer to poorer Americans 
with that money running through Washington. It doesn't do that. OK, that's a fundamental thing. Now, let's have a little bit of a look at how I've emphasized up to now the public policies that I think are important and that are a direct consequence of federalism. Let's look at now at a bit at how Canadians see our system. Or we'll start first with the Americans, the outsiders, how they see our system. Now, the world needs more Canada. Uh, this, you might remember when President Obama visited Parliament, uh, that was uh, his argument. The world needs more Canada. It's not clear what more Canada the world needs, but I think it was pretty clear to uh, Obama had said, th said this, Joe Biden said it when he visited as, as Vice President. Um, Bono had also said it, that the world needs more Canada. Uh, and so what is the world, what, what do we mean by that? And then we also have The Economist saying pretty much the same thing. Liberty moves north. And this is a comparison of Canada and the US, the argument that um, US, the land of opportunity, had ceased to be the land of opportunity. If you want to go to the land of opportunity, go north come to Canada. So what are these people talking about? Well, you know, if you dissect their messages, it's very clear that what they're talking about are really our public policies. You know, they're talking about uh, an op a relatively open immigration policy, uh, an open uh, trading policy. They're talking about the high quality of um, the health care, the universal uh, uh, health care. They're talking as well about a social sa safety net for people who are in need of it. So it really, again, comes down to the public policies. And it seems to me that, again, as I just want to emphasize that these uh, are policies that only happen because of governments being willing uh, to cooperate. Now let's have a di slightly different look and see. Now I hope, let me just explain this a little bit. My son did this. So you know, I, I, take no, I take no credit for this. I've always been hugely impressed with people who could do you know, charts and histograms and things. And, and so I said to Matthew, I just need a histogram here. I need some bar charts. And he click, 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 click. And there it all was. You know? And then last night, he added the flourish of the flags. So I thought the flags, so we've got the Canadian flag, and we've got this multicolored one are all the provincial flags. You can find them all in one spot and put them in there. So the first column is Canada. The second column is, is the provinces. And then the third one, obviously, you recognize the American flag. That's, that's um, the US. Now, these are public opinion uh, data. And uh, what uh, they're, the, the data were gathered in Canada uh, and in the US. And what they're getting at here is the question of whether governments are working. Are your governments working for you? And the, over here on the left, we have generally working. Second set of history, uh, 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 second set is working with major problems. The third one is broken, but working in some areas. And the last set, or the second last set, is completely broken. And then the very last set is um, they, they can't say. So, it's really amazing, you know, when you look at that, the number of Americans who think their government is broken or completely broken. So if you add that up, 40 and 26, you've got you know, two thirds of Americans who think their government is broken or uh, completely broken or broken but working in some areas. Now let's look at Canada. Well, if you look at Canada, you take the generally working and working with major problems you've got 50%. So you know we're not exactly great cheerleaders for, for Canada, but we do have a much more favorable opinion of our governments in Canada uh, than um, Americans have of their government. The, the generally working one, the second one, the provinces, uh, they tend to come off. So we got uh, three into his five, 56. So they kind of come off a little bit better than the, the government of Canada. But again, it's just a very startling contrast where you have less than a third of Americans who think their, their government is generally working or working with some problems as compared to 50% of Canadians who are of that view. Now, um, there are a few other data that, just another one that I, because Matthew did these, I need to show them to you, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so, so this is another set of data that, um, again, it's public opinion data. 
And um, this is getting at what are the values that Canadians and Americans think are important when it comes to, to public policy making. Uh, and we see some, again, some interesting contrasts here. Um, this first one is promoting equality and fairness. Canadians tend to think that's a more important value than uh, Americans. Providing a public safety net, again, we see visible Canadian-American differences. And then supporting private charity for the poor, the last one, again. And to me, that again suggests a kind of a, a looking out for, for the other person, um, a recognition that you know, governments are there to kind of equalize the opportunities, to equalize the, the wealth, to look after those who can't necessarily look after themselves. OK, so um, I think those are, as I say, some interesting distinctions. And, and what I conclude from that is that essentially that the Canadian federal system, which is you know, next to the parliamentary system, it is the crucial political institution in this country that the Canadian, political, the Canadian federal system is working rather well, at least as viewed by uh, Canadians. That's not to say all is well. You could expect that Quebecers have a less benign view, as they do. There are some important regional differences. There are also uh, perceptions that, again, we wouldn't be surprised to find that uh, most of the Canadians think that uh, about 60% of Canadians tend to think that the federal government fa favors one another region other than their own, so that kind of thing. We know Westerners believe Ottawa favors Ontario. The Maritimers tend to believe that Ottawa favors everybody but them. You know, so these are, these are perceptions that we're all familiar with. OK, now what I want to do now is I've got a bit of time left. I do want to move on to um, onto, uh, some of the issues that I think are, are really crucial for us. <laughs> and uh, I don't, yeah, don't, don't read any partisan uh, bias into this one, please. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think that all of us can appreciate the challenge that climate change presents for us. It is a particular challenge in this country because, um, uh, you know, we have provinces that own their natural resources, including their oil and gas, right? And those are major sources of, uh, of revenues for provinces like Alberta or Newfoundland before the price of oil went, went down. Um, and so you have provinces really caught in this uh, division uh, between promoting their energy sources and having to deal with the environment. And as we know, uh, we have sometimes uh, prime ministers uh, like Stephen Harper who don't really believe in the science of climate change. And uh, hi, kids. Welcome to another episode of Fun with Science. Today we're going to make paper airplanes out of environmental reports and studies. OK. And then there's another one that I have here, which is <laughs> um, Stephen Harper uh, basically not meeting the targets that the government of Canada had agreed to. Um, and uh, that was the story of inaction. As we know, we had uh, quite a few wasted years uh, in terms of dealing with, with climate change. Now, this isn't going to be an easy issue for, for, for the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. We know it's not going to be an easy issue, again, because we have these, uh, what we would call a, a very much a regional economy, where different resources are important to different people. But to his great credit, uh, you know, Trudeau has, uh, Justin Trudeau has signed an agreement with the provinces for a kind of pan-Canadian uh, framework uh, to deal with climate change. Um, I like this one, though, because it shows how difficult it is going to be for, for Justin Trudeau riding the environment, riding oil, you know. <laughs> it won't be easy. But I think what, the message that I want to give with you, leave with you, though, is that we should not expect climate leadership necessarily just to come from Ottawa. It is going to take huge leadership from the provinces. We saw that in the case of British Columbia already. They were the first province to bring in a carbon uh, tax. And now I think, you know, arguably, this has been the most, the most significant development on the climate change file has been um, the, the Alberta uh, Premier, Rachel Notley, uh, indicating that she is going to try to do something about climate change. And you, know, you see arrayed behind her, um, People from the oil industry, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, she's really tried very hard to create this coalition of support for climate change. So I think that is really going to be the compelling issue for us uh, you know, uh, 
you know, for the foreseeable future. We obviously are going to be at this for some time. And again, it's only going to be action if we can get the governments to agree. Now, the next thing, of course, the second huge challenge for us, I've already mentioned, is, is indigenous peoples. You know, our federal system does not create a third order of government for indigenous peoples. We have, you know, federal government, federal government, we have the provincial government, and we've had um, capacity for those two to negotiate and address issues. What we haven't had successfully is a way to bring indigenous peoples into the governing structures. Um, some of you will recall that during the constitutional reform talks um, in the 1980s into the 1990s, indigenous leaders were at the table. Uh, there were provisions in the constitutional agreements, the, the, in the constitutional proposals for Meech Lake and the Charlton Accord that would have recognized indigenous uh, self-government. Um, those things died. Those constitutional proposals didn't get anywhere. But it remains a compelling problem, a compelling policy issue for Canada. As the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples said in 1996, uh, Aboriginal peoples are really the worst off of Canadians. They have ill health. Their health is much poorer than, non -Cana than other Canadians. Uh, their housing is deplorable, polluted water, inadequate school, poverty and family breakdowns are more at rates that are found more often in developing countries than in Canada. And so this is going to be a huge challenge. And I think that really we have an institutional challenge here. How are we going to find a way in this structure, which really is, as I say, doesn't have a provision for indigenous peoples to be able to represent themselves? How are we going to find a way to do that? I'm optimistic that we will do that. The, the Supreme Court of Canada is helping out here because it has ruled that governments have a constitutional duty to consult indigenous peoples on matters that affect their rights. So with that constitutional obligation to consult indigenous peoples on matters that affect their rights, federalism is going to have to continue to evolve. Let me come to my last challenge. Um, <laughs> this is, you may recognize uh, <laughs> the president of the United States um, busy shredding NAFTA. So uh, he's shredding a lot of stuff, right? Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Civil Rights Act, um, Roe versus Wade, the uh, abortion rights, and uh, well, even the Magna Carta, although I'm not sure the Magna Carta is actually you know, a document that's available to, uh, to, to President Trump. Um, and then here's another one, which is also a lot of fun. Uh, not fun, but so much as it is scary. The party pooper, trade relations, oh great, says Canada, as we celebrate our 150th um, anniversary. So dealing with the, with the United States has not been easy. But I think, again, what we can see here is that the federal system has evolved. You know, I've done quite a bit of work on trading relations. And under the Constitution, uh, it's only the government of Canada that can negotiate and sign an international agreement, including a, a trade treaty. But the problem is that the government of Canada cannot implement those provisions of an international agreement that fall into provincial jurisdiction. So we have a kind of sort of divided jurisdiction here. And so what the government of Canada has quite sensibly had to do is to bring the provinces more and more into the negotiation of international trade agreements and as well into the settling of trade disputes. And we've had plenty of those with the United States. So the federal system has evolved here as well. Uh, we've found ways to get outside of the, of the formal jurisdictional responsibilities, and recognize that this is an area of overlapping responsibility, overlapping uh, uh, responsibility, not so much jurisdiction. And I'm, you know, but again, it does take a lot of goodwill on the part of both of, uh, of governments at both uh, federal and provincial levels. So let me just conclude then very quickly. Um, so we have had a very resilient federal system. Uh, its resilience, I think, owes everything to um, the requirement and the willingness of governments at both orders, provincial and federal, to work together. We should never just think that this is up to the government of Canada alone. It requires an awful lot of leadership in provincial capitals as well. But it also requires a willingness to recognize that you really can't do a whole lot unless you actually work with the other order of government. In doing that, I think we've built in a pretty good safety net for Canadians. It is not perfect by any means. 
Uh, we always hear problems um, around uh, you know, access to health care. We hear lots of those problems. But uh, you know, I think that those are problems that all the Western industrialized countries have. And obviously, we still need to work on them. I think we've done not too bad of a job in recent years of trying to avoid the politics of blame. Um, we seem to be much more in a collaborative mode. And let's hope that works. We also clearly need the one really serious problem with the way the federal system has been set up is that it doesn't make formal provision for indigenous peoples to be part of the uh, policy making that so affects them. Uh, and so on the table for, for political scientists, but not for today, uh, are rules around how we can formalize indigenous um, participation, indigenous collaboration in policy making. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, for that uh, uh, great presentation. I, I, uh, I always learn a lot by listening to the faculty, and I learned a lot today. That, that's just great. So I think what we're going to do uh, by popular demand is go straight into um, a question and answers. If you need to, to leave the room or refresh your coffee, you can do that. But uh, we're going to move right into uh, the, the question uh, portion of, of uh, today's talk. And um, if you want to ask for elaboration, or if you want to challenge, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. No yeah. problem with that. We yeah. want a healthy discussion. Uh, I, I could also add that I'm, I'm open to taking any questions on Canadian politics. If, if federalism isn't really your thing, and you have questions about Canadian politics, I'd be happy to, to address them. This is your big chance. Yeah. Oh, Wendy. Just when you were talking about <clears throat> um, trade and, and uh, US, Canada, whatever, I just need to throw this out, because I heard it yesterday, fact. According to the CBC, there are more cows, dairy cows specifically, in Wisconsin than in all of Canada. Just do what you want with that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have actually done a bit in the past around supply management in Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, our, uh, you know, for those of you who, who maybe don't know the, the dairy policy in this country, we, you do, obviously. Um, we manage supply to demand, right? So we control production of milk in this country um, so that it meets the domestic demand. And farmers have quotas, and they're not allowed to produce more milk than that. The US does not have a similar system. And so they can produce all the milk they want. And then, of course, they get into a problem of what do you do when you've got a big milk surplus and the prices are down, right? So our, in order to practice this supply management at home to keep the, the supply equal to the demand, we've had, we have put border controls, right? So we don't, we, there's only a certain amount of dairy products that are allowed into Canada. Um, and above that, you have to pay very high tariffs if you want to get access to the Canadian market. Uh, the most recent issue has come about with this um, particular class of milk that where Americans have a lot of it, de-filtered milk, and, and they were trying to, sh they're shipping it into Canada because it's cheaper uh, than Canadian milk. and dairy processors and people who make cheese and yogurt and things like that obviously wanted the lower cost product. Here in Ontario, um, we created this new class of milk and we raised the price up for this deafiltered milk. So, so we're now ostensibly creating another barrier to Americans being able to get their surplus milk into Canada. So it's a very different system that we run in Canada. It's a system that the US doesn't like because they see a big potential market here. But um, it's also important to keep in mind that there are a lot of subsidies uh, around um, the production of milk in, in the US as well. So there are different ways of protecting your dairy industry in the two countries. And uh, Donald Trump has found out about our system, and he doesn't like it one bit. Yeah. Yeah. what year uh, the histogram stats came right. from. Right, so 2013 for the American and 2014 for Canada. Before Trump. Before Trump, yeah, 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 so imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> I've got the mic. Okay, yeah. As <laughs> um, part of the problem dealing with indigenous slash Aboriginal Canadians, the fact that the federal and provincial governments for 
decades left the aboriginals to religious groups. So the whole residential school program, or most of it, and many of the, um, the punishments, for lack of a better word, meted upon um, the, these people actually was a, was a problem of neglect on the part of the federal and provincial governments and allowing the religions to do it. I'm going to mitigate that by saying the Anglican Church of Canada has an Aboriginal bishop who is Indigenous and has no actual see. He is for all of Canada and all of the Indigenous people, but is part of the problem that we neglected yeah. to do anything about it. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. It is, a, it is a, a, a history of neglect, but it is also, I think, if you read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, um, it is not just neglect, but it was a deliberate effort on the part of, of some parties to, um, to, to rob uh, Indigenous peoples of their culture and their language. So it's, you know, neglect might be part of the ledger, but, you know, this kind of, you know, what we want to call it, cultural genocide, some people call it, I'm not sure that's the right term or not, but certainly, you know, an effort to assimilate, to, to, to deprive Indigenous peoples of their language and culture was that that was, in, I think, intentional on some parts. Whether it was the government of Canada's intention is, you know, again, I, you know, people can come down on different sides on that one, but it's very good to know that the Anglican Church does have an Indigenous um, bishop because and this is obviously not just going to be an issue for governments alone. It's, it's going to... Okay. Thank you. We have a very aging society right now that's de demanding more of our health resources, and also we're dying off. So we need immigrants. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that I understand that there's going to be a 40% drop in the amount of jobs available in the future. So how are we going to do all this, keep people working? Mm -hmm and getting people to fill up our, our Canada mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, you're absolutely right that Canada relies on, on immigration to, um, to uh, rejuvenate our labor force, if you will. Um, but at the same time, you're right. I mean, the, 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 the labor force is really transitioning. Um, you know, old jobs that used to be there aren't there anymore. Um, the government of Canada, you know, has come out with a kind of infrastructure program, which presumably it's moving on two tracks, kind of the immigration policy track. And obviously our policy there on immigration is, is largely, uh, as compared to refugee policy, is largely designed to attract highly skilled immigrants, right? So there's that, you know, so we've targeted um, that um, immigrant uh, immigration um, group. But um, these are, you're right, these are huge challenges uh, to find a way to retool people who uh, and re-educate and to kind of help people get the jobs that they need as the economy has shifted dramatically around us. Yeah, but that's what they're paid to do, right? <laughs> this lecture is uh, an excellent example of this very good program that I very much enjoy and hopefully there will be more next year. In terms of being a citizen of the city, I always thought there was a third level of government. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. And with urbanization, what are we now, 70% urban in Canada? Or, um, or whatever it's it is. About 50, but, I think, yeah. But, but it's certain, certainly a much larger proportion than they used to be, and that the process is continuing. Yeah. Would you be able to say a few words about this aspect, how that fits into the federalism and, yeah. and, and, and the, the and the tensions that come from it. Yeah, right, right. That's I, I thought to mention cities in my talk, but you can see I'm quite long winded as it is and I kind of ran out of time. So cities cities are again a, a really important um, issue because under the constitution, cities are creatures of provinces. So they don't you know well, all of us who went through the, the, um, the amalgamation in Toronto know that the Ontario government basically decided you know, how cities were going, to, what, what they were going to do and, and how they were going to be structured, right? So in that sense, 
it's a very difficult issue for the government of Canada because uh, the moment that it does start to try to meddle too much in cities, uh, then provinces you know, typically will say, well, ha you know, hold off. This is our responsibility. This is our jurisdiction. But you're absolutely right that, that um, a big, again, you know, cities are kind of similar to, to the um, indigenous people's governing issue, right? In the sense that there's not a formal way for cities to have input into these negotiations. Now, mind you, there's a whole bunch of informal stuff that's built up, and the, the, the mayors of the largest cities are a pretty powerful lobby, and they lobby Ottawa, and they lobby um, their provincial capitals. But, you know, if we had um, decent funding for cities, if the federal government transferred monies to cities for public transportation, we would be also much better off. We would have, you know, transportation, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation count, account for about 25% of Canada's total greenhouse gas emissions. And you can imagine how those would go down if we did have so much better a public transportation system. So it's that kind of gap there. Cities are one of those gaps. Uh, I mean, who would have imagined in 1867 that cities would become so important? And again, that's a case where our federal system has not evolved the way it needs to, to really give cities the, um, the attention and the revenues. It's really largely about revenues, the revenues that they, that they deserve. Solution, I just think there should be direct transfers from Ottawa to cities. There should be. Uh, well, the provinces, you know, if you give it to, you can, you can run it through the provinces, but Ottawa has got to take more responsibility for cities, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Can I have another question? For sure. Would it not have been better when it comes to transportation for the province to take control of our transit system rather than giving it to the municipal politicians and look at the mess they've made? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> we we have it the ca on the campus. We have city city study scholars, right? And they they will have a view on that. Yeah, they a much more informed view on that than I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a view, but not necessarily well informed. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Grace. Hi. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I just had a question. It's kind of loaded. But what is your stance on electoral reform? And what impacts would different reforms have on public policies and our overall federal system? Mm -hmm. Electoral reform. Um, well, I am a fan of proportional representation. Um, I think it's fair. You know, I think proportional representation is, is fair. You, know, you, you get the seats um, in the parliament or in the legislature proportionate to you know, the, the votes that you got. It's always a great shock to, to our students in Canadian politics when you point out that a government can have 65% um, of the seats with, you know, about 39% of the votes. I mean, students, how did that happen? Uh, kind of, uh, so I'm, I'm a, for, a fan of proportional representation. Um, you know, the downside, as you know, is that you get, I don't know if it's a downside, but the consequence is that you get more coalition governments. I actually happen to think coalition governments are not a bad thing because coalition governments force parties to work together. You know, you have to cooperate. You have to accommodate uh, minority uh, views. Um, some people look at Europe and, and think this is a bad thing, but I tend to think that if, we're, if there's anything that we can take away from the general kind of malaise that's hanging over electoral politics all across the Western world is that you know, people are very dissatisfied with the existing parties. There's a, a really strong demand for uh, more voices to be got into politics, uh, you know, people are really clamoring for change. And I think that uh, proportional representation systems are a way to do that. I mean, you're going to see this in the runoff now of the, of the French election. Um, is, uh, you know, pe people who voted for, for the socialist candidate, uh, for um, uh, the, Republic, uh, the Republican uh, Pilon, the candidate, they're going to have to decide where they're going to go now. They've got two choices. And so there's going to have to be, you know, some kind of coalition building right there. Uh, in the absence of that, um, you, know, you, you have to build it before you get elected, and then you, you've got a commitment to, to that coalition, I think. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in proportional representation and electoral reform. As a follow-up, the present uh, Liberal government has a huge focus on public policy right now, a, a variety of them, um, and working in partnership in tandem with the provinces around housing, let's just say, for example. Yeah, yeah. So if, I guess what I'm wondering is, if we have a present um, 
government in place now that seems to really take an interest and a keen interest on looking at a lot of the public policies that have been neglected in years, years past for whatever reason. Um, if this present, if we were to have proportional representation and let's just say a different party were to take government and have a less of a focus maybe on some of the public policies that impact all of our lives, um, do, you, do you see a negative to that? Or I guess what I'm wondering is, um, was the choice to not have electoral reform because of you know, the fact that the present government in place is looking at some of the public policies and social issues that are really needing to be addressed and the fear of not having that. Do you understand where I'm going? Yeah, I do. Like, so so you're worried that about, I guess if I understand you correctly, you're, you're worried that um, if you get coalition government, you might not have that same capacity to lead on public policy issues. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. The answer. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't see that. Um, um, I mean, ultimately, parties have to be responsible to the voters. And if voters think that these are crucial issues, if housing is a crucial issue, if social justice for indigenous peoples is a crucial issue, if, if uh, de dealing something, doing something about climate change is a crucial issue, if we as Canadians think those are important issues, then governments can't stray too far from those issues. Now, there are some things that you know, are more controversial, where the, where the electorate is more split. Um, and you're right. I mean, in that sense, you know, a government uh, that has momentum behind certain policies, um, that, that might lose, that, 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 that momentum might be lost if you get a shift in government. But, um, you know, this is a, you know, my view of Canada is it, it's a very heterogeneous country, right? It's a country that's got, most people say, too much geography. Uh, every region, you know, is, is quite different. And you just have to find ways to accommodate. You have to find ways to compromise. You have to find ways to try to appeal to people across the board. And um, if that is with one party, like the Liberal Party, trying to broker all those interests, that's one formula. But then the other formula is you know, that you have a coalition government where, where different parties uh, speak to different parts of that electorate, different issues in the electorate. Um, you know, Coalition governments and PR systems work quite well in a number of European states. Yeah, and beyond, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not afraid of that. Could you give us examples of coalition governments? Well, Germany. Please, Germany. Germany has had them. Scandinavia has sometimes has them. New, New Zealand has had them. The Netherlands, yeah. yeah. They're actually probably more common than, you know, it's the Westminster parliamentary system with its simple plurality system that where you get this you know, simple plurality system. One the winner takes all politics, right? And that tends to go with the Westminster parliamentary system that we inherited from the UK, right? Yeah. Can you explain why the Liberals backed down on that change in the electoral policy? Why did the Liberals back down on, uh, on, on electoral reform? <coughs> Yeah, well, I'm not, a, I'm not inside the party, so it's just conjecture. Um, but, you know, if you look around the, the world, the only time, it's very hard once governments have a majority to persuade them that they're not always going to have that majority. Like, the electoral system has worked for them. They got the majority with, I uh, can't remember what the popular vote was, but you know, it wasn't a majority. I don't know, it's in the... It was about 40 or something, was it? It wasn't a huge amount. Uh, so so we, that, that's the kind of winning formula. And if you're the, the party that's ahead and taking all the seats, you just think that's going to go on forever, right? And they have a very popular um, prime minister, so they figure the formula will work for them. I actually thought it was, it, it was short-sighted because you could imagine uh, if you move to PR, if you move to proportional representation, I think the Liberal Party could have been guaranteed of being a part of, of a government forever. It just wouldn't have had, wouldn't necessarily have had the exclusive power that it has now. But you know, if, if the Canadian electorate does kind of lean slightly center left, as it does, um, they would have been guaranteed be, to be a part of a government. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they didn't really want to share power, I think, yeah. So where does the pressure come from to, on the government not to do that? To break an electoral promise? Yeah. 
Well, um, you know, when, again, it just comes after the fact, right? If you decide, if the electorate decides that this is a pretty crucial issue and the, and the Liberals broke a promise on it, then you can punish them at the next election. But there's not anything you can do in the interim, really, other than write your MP and <laughs> kick up a fuss. And, yeah. I, I guess my really question was, um, they come up with this policy, they want to do it, then who changes their mind? Is it the several uh, students? No. Or, no. From other, uh, well, it I think it would have been an internal party um, calculation. They would have, they would have decided that, um, uh, that, that you know that, that this was a promise they could break because um, you know the that it was going to tie their hands and. So I think that this is all internal party. But also, it is kind of interesting that a number of academics did weigh in on this as well. Political scientists weighed in. I have a colleague downtown who thinks that proportional representation is a bad idea. And so the, uh, the parliamentary committee that was looking at this did hear from a lot of academics, and not all of them agree with it. I mean, some people like the, um, the system at the moment because you know, if you've got um, you know, one party that's in government, you know who to blame. I mean, that, that is you know, what you could call government responsibility, right? You can't shift the blame to the coalition partner the way, say, happened in the UK with, uh, with David Cameron and, and the Lib Dems. You, know, you can blame the Lib Dems for everything that goes wrong, and you get the credit for everything that goes right, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes? But don't you think they had already made the decision? I've forgotten her name. Mm. Monsef? Um, Marianne Monsef, yeah. Uh, Marianne Monsef, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you're right, yeah. They should have put, I mean, if they had been serious, I quite agree with you, they would have put a heavyweight behind that. Uh, Ralph Goodale, somebody like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you make a comment on the Senate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I make a comment on the Senate? Yeah. Yeah. Whether the Senate is you know, part of yeah, our I actually don't think it's a necessary part of our government. Um, so if you think about the original purpose of the Senate, <coughs> uh, as Senates in other federations, uh, the United States, you know, equivalent, if you will, um, and the, well, the House of Lords, I don't think many of us want to see that as an example, but, but you know, you think about the role of Senates in Australia, the US, um, the upper house in Germany, those institutions are a way to represent the constituent units of the federation. So in that case, the provinces, right? Um, in Canada, it would be the provinces. So you should have a way, uh, that should be their obligation, to represent the people of the province that they're chosen to represent. But we know our Senate doesn't do that. I mean, it's been a partisan chamber. It's been there to uh, support the political party that you know, appointed you, right? And we saw that that partisanship reach its height with, uh, with Prime Minister Harper. Uh, now, you know, we'll see what happens with, with Prime Minister Trudeau and the changes that he's made. He's trying to move away from that partisanship. He's trying to make the Senate, um, you know, to, to, to disassociate the, uh, the Prime Minister's office from the Senate. Uh, we'll see how, how that goes. I mean, even, you know, we, provinces don't have a Senate. You know, so why does the government account? It's not obvious. That said, you know, there has been some very good work done by senators over the years. So there's the Senate, and then there are some of the senators. And you can think of people, you know, when I was researching the, the free trade agreement with the, with the first time when we entered into the 1989 free trade agreement with the United States, some of the most um, uh, instructive and most useful research done on that free trade agreement was done by the Senate. Yeah. You also have had very good reports of various senators, Michael Kirby, you can think of Michael Kirby, and the work that he did on mental health issues. Uh, and so they, they can produce some really, really great reports that are highly useful for public policy. Um, but that, you know, there's two, two, I mean, do we, do we get enough good reports for the money that we pay? Probably not. Well, PEI was, um, yeah, they did. They did have upper houses, and they've almost all, the, the, PEI still, still has a kind of two-chamber 
um, legislature. But yeah, they, 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 that, that was a part of, of provincial governments in the aftermath of Confederation. So there was a kind of parallel structure, but it has since it disappeared, yeah. Yeah. I know there is no answer to this, and maybe it's just a reflection of my. Oh, I can speak loudly. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> um, but the question of accountability. If we look at the Senate, um, all, well, Don Meredith, I'm sorry, I don't understand mm -hmm. why he's still there. I don't understand why a few of them are there. Um, the yeah. issues in the provincial liberals under Dalton McGuinty and the gas plants and the mm -hmm. extraordinary amount of money that was spent, uh, the fiddling over the decisions of transport in the city of Toronto. I mean, how do you reach some kind of accountability in government? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a big difference between the Senate being held to account and your elected politicians being held to account. Because with your elected politicians, you can vote them out of office. But you can't do that with the Senate. And this is the whole problem with Meredith. Senator Meredith is that he's going to have to be disbanded by his own colleagues and it's not even quite clear I mean people are reading the rules around the Senate and they're not absolutely clear that they actually can kick him out yeah so I mean that's so accountability you know to the public can you know comes through the electoral process but the Senate doesn't it's not elected as you know so we, really it is a challenge and so the only way you get accountability there it seems to me is the weight of public opinion Right? You just, you know, people just have to say to, um, uh, to their MPs or their government, their, 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 the government that look, this is, you know, not that this, the government can put a lot of weight on that, but you can certainly write letters to the editor. You can, you know, have a, a public um, discussion about that, right? And, uh, and point out this is just not on. Yeah, disgrace them. <laughs> Just another, <clears throat> another useful um, tidbit that I throw around a lot because we need to remind ourselves of it. I think I have to credit Michael Moore, the big guy in the US, but he is, in his heart, a Republican in, in the true sense, not the party. And he says there's flip sides of the same coin. In a democracy, these are not optional, both of these, participation and vigilance. That means the accountability essentially is up to us. Yeah, no, I agree. Except that you, you people, most of you um, are doing your part. It's the young people who aren't, right? Because I suspect almost all of you vote, right? right. You stay informed and you vote. And the big problem is the participation of the under 30s, who kind of. Uh, it's, got, it's got quite a bit worse. It's got quite a bit worse, I think. Uh, but it has always, it, it's always been a problem. Uh, in the sense, I mean, you think about that demographic. They're studying. They're getting their careers going. They're having young children. I mean, they, you know, they, they just run out of time often, right? Um, and then they just get disengaged. They look at politics, and it all seems corrupt, you know, and uh, it seems meaningless. Uh, same son who helped me with the PowerPoints uh, says the same thing. It's all, it's all a joke, Mom. It's all a joke. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I think we need to do a lot better in terms of engaging young people. And one way would be clearly to go to electronic voting, because they could just sit at home and just, and they're on their computers, they could just, you know, click for the, uh, the candidate they want. Um, it may just make it easier for people. So I, th I think it's not that they're not engaged, but they're not engaged in electoral politics. Like, they have a lot of views about what's going on in the world. They, they know a lot about what's going on in the world. But electoral politics, party politics, just, you know, it, it seems to either be corrupt or meaningless, or it's, it's just, it just doesn't seem to work as far as they're concerned. So you see young people out in, in demonstrations. They join social movements. You know, you would not have environmental activism were it not for young people. You know, all of those kind of um, social mobilization things that really matter to politics, that's the route they often take rather than uh, the voting um, party politics route. I may have the wrong idea, but I was a bit concerned about how the MPs are actually chosen in proportional representation. Well, there's various methods, right? So there's, there's no single way, uh, but, uh, but typically, um, you would be presented with a list of candidates, right? 
and parties, I'm sorry, this is going to be interfering like that. Um, you know, uh, parties present you with a list. Um, you, you'd go to the, the ballot box, you'd see a list of candidates, and sometimes you can vote for, um, depending on the system, you could vote for all the candidates from one political party, or you could vote for candidates from different political parties. And essentially what happens is that you, the winning candidate has to get 50% plus one of the votes, and so you start retabulating people's votes lower down, and you shift, people give your preferences. So, so you went to the vote, you went to the ballot box, and you had, let's, let's make it simple, suppose that there were four candidates, and you ranked them in order of preference, uh, and then your, um, if, if your first preference got 50% plus one of the vote, then that would be the person that would represent your riding. But if that person didn't, then we start to uh, count your second, your third, and your fourth choices. So people, it's, a, it's preferential voting in the sense that you get to rank candidates according to their preferences. Now, if you just vote for a party slate, a lot of people say the problem there is that you really, sometimes people just want a candidate, right, rather than a party. Uh, but there are ways around that. Um, you know, where you find proportional representation systems, you find more women in Parliament. So parties, you know, often, uh, if they, they put forward a slate of candidates that's 50% women at least, and then they decide to put women at the top of their list. So that if they win, you know, that seat, then the, that riding or that seat or that constituency, then it's the woman who's going to be at the top of the list who's going to be representing it. But in that system, the party is choosing the MPs. Yes, it will be internal. Well, it, they're putting the list forward, but you're choosing them as a voter. Uh, you're not getting to, to choose the one who's at the top, but you're choosing among the candidates, I guess, yeah. So if the party did put you know, a woman at the top and, she, and they got the, the, the percentage of votes they needed to take that riding, then yeah, they would have decided who was going to represent that riding. But in some ways, they do that now anyway, right? I mean, the party puts forward the candidate, and unless you're a member of that party, you don't get to choose that. Say, okay, I'm going to vote. I'm, you know, you're voting for the candidate, the party at the same time, usually, right? Well, yes, yeah, so that's the controversy that you're thinking about, right, whether there's too much meddling from the prime minister's office in the nomination of the candidates rather than leaving it to the local party organization to choose. Yeah, we saw that most recently in, in the ridings, the by-elections, the by yeah. Well, and we saw it, I don't remember her name. The, um, she was going to run in, our, in the riding at Lawrence Avenue Road, Edmonton. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. it happened. <laughs> Well, again, it's another reason to get involved in party politics if you aren't already, because if you do feel strongly about, uh, about the local constituency being able to choose the candidate, then you know, get involved and, and, uh, and say so. Hi, Professor Skogstad. Uh, thank you so much for an interesting um, lecture. Um, I just had a question about, about your comments um, regarding the Aboriginal peoples. Um, so in terms of um, in terms of bringing the Aboriginal peoples together, um, like in the in, um, in Canada and having you know um, the federal government and the provincial government um, and all of us um, um, do something about um, the Aboriginal peoples, in terms of um, um, uh, making a public policy, what would you um, suggest that we do? to try to help them? Well, I don't the think, yeah, steps. that's a good question. Thank you for it. I mean, I don't think it's that we decide what to do, right? This has to be, indigenous peoples have to be making, making uh, the policies that matter to them, right? But what is clear to me is that there just are not enough resources for indigenous peoples. I mean, we see the housing, the education, the, you know, the whole thing. So there needs to be a much, much better funding of, uh, of indigenous people's associations, of indigenous uh, communities. And ultimately, my view would be that it needs to be, uh, it's, it's up to indigenous peoples themselves to decide um, you know, how to govern themselves. So it's a devolution model that we, we give. Uh, and and you know, I, just, I do think that it's, you know, what, we have, what we need to do as governments and as peoples is to provide indigenous peoples with the resources they need. And they are really financial resources in many cases, but ultimately self-governing for indigenous peoples means that they get to decide. Right? So it's, yeah, I leave that. That's a discussion for I indigenous peoples and, and governments to, uh, to sort out. But that would mean that they could raise their own taxes. 
Right. Yeah, but yeah. Which they, uh, they would have to pay themselves as well, which is an issue. Well, the, you know, there are something like well over 500 different um, in, uh, bands, right, different communities, and they vary di quite a bit in terms of, of their revenue raising capacity, in terms of their governing powers. You know, we find examples of self-governing um, indigenous communities in British Columbia, for example, uh, in the north, uh, and Quebec as well. So it's, it's just hugely heterogeneous in terms of, of um, the arrangements between governments and self-government uh, for indigenous peoples. I, you know, I'm not an authority on this at all. Um, but I do think, you know, what, the angle that I take on this as a student of federalism is you need to build in to the intergovernmental relationship that third relationship, the indigenous peoples, right? But the whole question of what kind of public policies are desirable is, is, is one for, the, for indigenous peoples to decide, I think. As far as young people go, do you think we could ever move to compulsory voting? Yeah. Well, they have it in Australia, as you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could, uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I guess. Yeah, the question is, so if you move to compulsory voting, does that mean that people would, would be more serious about getting themselves informed to vote? Right? Because I also think that if you vote, it's your obligation to know the issues and to know a little bit about who you're voting for. Right? So if you're just going to say, OK, compulsory voting without, yeah, and the electorate is, is by and large you know, not well informed, I don't think that's a solution to anything. Yeah. Wouldn't that also create a tremendous bureaucracy trying to keep track of who's voted and who hasn't? Yeah, what, what's the penalty going to be? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not throwing them in jail, are we? Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, I was wondering. I, I agree with the last question. I feel it's, uh, I think our generation tends to read newspapers and magazines and we get well informed about each candidate. For, uh, when Rob Ford got voted in, I was just appalled because I'd been reading so much about him, but people don't read uh, like they used to. So consequently, we get what we deserve, I guess. And the same in the United States, you're right, only 50% uh, of the people voted and so, of course, they ended up with what they got. But the other thing I was wondering, in Iceland, uh, what's their system like? And Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have to be honest. I, 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 I believe they're coalition governments, but you know, I'd have to check that. Sorry. You've given me some homework. Well, I mean, two things. One, of course, is Norway has oil, yes. right? It's a very rich country. Um, but Alberta had oil, too. And you know, Alberta didn't manage its oil revenues the way uh, Norway did. Uh, the thing about Sweden is, well, you're absolutely right in terms of a kind of a, uh, a model of a social welfare state. It, it really, you know, everybody studies Sweden because of that. And I think the coalition politics probably have something to do with it. But there's also um, quite high taxation rates. Uh, in Sweden, and um, this is a bit of a challenge for us uh, because the U.S. is, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, it doesn't really believe in taxes too much, right? Uh, you know, uh, and so we have to, in many ways, be competitive because so much of our trade is with the U.S. We have to be economically competitive with them. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a challenge of geography for us, uh, but yeah. I, I, you know, if, peop if people want good services, they basically have to be prepared to pay for them. But not everybody is. Yes, I think they should be for forced to pay taxes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, if they want the services, they should be. Yeah. So. If you can't, you got to stop complaining. If you're not going to pay taxes, I think they're wonderful taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. 
Well, thank you for that, uh, that great collection of, of terrific questions. And, and a special thank you to our speaker, uh, Dr. Grace Scott. <laughs>